fantastic to be here with um, Sam and Anish today to talk about um, gender bias, the role gender plays and specifically um, conversations around masculinity and toxic masculinity in, in the workplace. Before I start, um, it would be great if both of you could introduce yourselves, just say a little bit about you and, and the work that you do in this area. Sam, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for letting me be here today, um, especially to InterVest Company, obviously, um, for organising. Uh, so I'm Sam. I'm the Outreach Engagement Officer at Survivors UK, um, which is based in London, in England. Um, what Survivors UK does, we're an inclusive male rape and sexual abuse service. Uh, so what we mean by inclusive is we will support anyone who feels that our charity is best fit for them, whether they identify as male, transgender, non-binary, as well as any other genders, if they feel that we are the service for them, we will try to support them. My role um, at Survivors UK, uh, I have multiple, but my main one is the outreach and engagement side of things, which is trying to promote awareness and educate people about the topic of male rape and sexual abuse, to let people know that in some instances it happens in the first place, but then also to make sure that it is everyone's conversation and that we are all as a community supporting survivors of sexual violence, irrespective of gender. Um, so today it's great to be here because toxic masculinity is something that is clouded and so intertwined with sexual violence in general, um, especially male rape and sexual abuse. So thank you very much. Great, thanks, Sam. Yeah. Hi, uh, everyone. I'm Ayush Gupta. I'm working as Chief General Manager, Human Resource Development with Gail India Limited. Our company, Gail India Limited, is a government organization working in the field of natural gas transmission and distribution through pipelines. And we are also diversified into petrochemicals and other lines of business. And as far as my role in the company is concerned, uh, I look after the various activities of Human Resources Department, uh, right from a recruitment to career progression and uh, various other initiatives to be taken within the department. So performance management, career progression. So all roles re uh, related to human resource development are being taken care of. And earlier I was also involved with the learning and development function of the company. So I have spent close to six years in that learning and development function. And as far as the topic is concerned, uh, not looking after directly these issues in the company, but as part of the human resource team, uh, right from the selection process, when these kind of issues comes up in terms of uh, the right candidate to be selected, whether there are certain biases uh, occurring or taking place in that respect to the issues related to career progression, giving equal opportunity and uh, while rating the performance. So these issues, how do they come up uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and how do we ensure as a process owner that these issues are not uh, affecting the overall work culture in the organization is something which uh, we are directly or indirectly responsible of, uh, mm -hmm. for and happy to be part of the panel to take forward the discussion and hear the views of Sam and Johanna and uh, other panelists or the audience who are there to see it. Uh, we are from two different countries, so it will be a nice, uh, interesting perspective on how things are taken care of at the workplace. Uh, just not just in terms of the practice and the culture, but also in terms of the regulatory norms which the companies support or the countries support. So that I believe will be an interesting discussion to take this. Great, fantastic. And the first question that I want us to explore, um, which is quite a, a, a difficult question, I suppose, to, to start, but I think it's an important one that we start with, is talking about the role of um, toxic masculinity in the workplace and whether we think that that's a roadblock to us achieving inclusion. And I suppose, before we jump into that question, I think it would be useful to uh, explain and define what we mean by toxic masculinity. And Sam, um, I, I turn to you uh, if, if you're happy to provide us with your explanation and, and definition as to what we mean by that. 
uh, of course. Uh, I think, to be honest, I think my definition of toxic masculinity and the one that I kind of use might be different to other people's uh, based on whoever you might speak to. Um, yeah. So feel free for anyone to jump in and uh, uh, argue. Um, so I think that toxic masculinity is for boys, uh, even before they're born, we have an expectation of certain gender roles that should be applied to uh, to boys and men. Uh, so for example, someone should be strong and they need to not be vulnerable, they need to be leaders, etc, etc, be sporty, tall, muscly. And where what this forms is this idea of masculinity. Um, and masculinity in itself, uh, I think this is a really good place to start with this, uh, isn't necessarily a toxic thing. But where it becomes too much, where someone feels that they can't show their emotions or they can't seek help because they're scared of not seeming masculine or be, being seen as weak or vulnerable, that's where it becomes toxic. That is where it can be unhealthy to adopt and take these ideals of masculinity too far. No, absolutely. I think that's a really important point and one I'd agree with there, that masculinity in itself shouldn't be deemed negative or shouldn't be something that people, um, men and women, identify as having things that may be described as, as, as masculine, masculine traits. But it's when, as you say, these are become norms and um, expectations for every male to fall within those expectations and, and, and those those definitions. Um, and before we, again, we come on to answer that question, um, and I'd be really interested specifically to think about this in the context of the difference between UK and India culture. Do you think that there are any differences when we talk about the definition of masculinity um, across the UK and India, and specifically um, around the, the, the role of tos toxic masculinity? Yeah, uh, what I think uh, culturally, the two countries are uh, a bit different. Although at the workplace, when coming to workplace, now we have multinational companies also uh, within the country operating and uh, there are typical Indian business houses which are there. But culturally, if you look into the background or the history, uh, the two countries in terms of the definition of masculinity and toxic masculinity, uh, masculinity we see, uh, I see personally see a bit of a difference in the two how do we see these issues in the two countries mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the culture as on date uh, i'll say uk because i have the opportunity to spend about three months in uk also and and go around and see so i'll see that uh, per se the culture is more open in uk but traditionally in india it has been seen as a different thing it has been seen as a male dominated word although if we go lying back in terms of our scriptures and other issues, the feminine gender has been also been put in a very high pedestal. We have female goddesses and uh, the respect for female gender or the feminine gender has been great in mm -hmm. the historical or the uh, spiritual literature we have. So there has been a lot of respect and there have been uh, female leaders also, a lot of those things. So in terms of that, but society per se is uh, dominated or is considered to be male dominated. There are parts of India who are having the matriarchal society also rather than patriarchal society. So if we go to the eastern part of the country, there are states which are totally uh, feminine dominated or the matriarchal societies are there. So it's a mixed culture in India. Uh, but predominantly, it is still considered to be a male-dominated society. And in terms of uh, another factor, when we talk of the toxicity of male, so that is also affecting at the workplace where it is conceived uh, or many a times that kind of a bias or perception is there that the society or the workplace is being controlled by the men more than the female, but which may or may not be true in uh, the actual sense. But that is the perception that is being carried down and which at times weighs on the male members also to deliver or not to 
share their views openly or they may not be able to express uh, their emotions properly like somebody says that men are not supposed to cry so they are hiding their emotions that at times at a senior level with the bosses level at uh, reporting level they will have to hide their emotions and not being able to come out in their true uh, perspective to share with the team so that is something which uh, affects the overall performance of the team at the workplace as well as there that is where somewhere the bias starts when in spite of a person being fair and not trying to do anything else but that puts an extra pressure on the person to portray himself as if uh, he is something who is not affected by these things so that is something which we need to be careful of and thank you for sh sharing that and i sorry my bit technical and uh, i absolutely agree with those those points there and i think something very interesting that both of you were saying is that actually regardless of whether the stereotypes in a particular culture in this case the uk and india or if we were to add the us into it or, or, or other countries slightly differ from country to country what i think is common across the globe is that there is stereotypes for each gender and we we know that we acknowledge that whichever country we we're in we know that we do have uh, very strong gender stereotypes and very strong um expectations in terms of behavior of particular genders as you were describing there and um, anush the not being able to share views openly not being able to open up um, in terms of, of, of emotions and I think that those um, those reinforced in the workplace are sometimes potentially stronger in some countries than, than in others and I think the work that we've been doing in, in, in India and, and the conversation issue we've, we've had previously are, are, are often that actually is there a maturity or is there um, differences across the, the, the different geographies if we were to then uh, finish and uh, that answering that that question, so we're understanding that there definitely are some stereotypes for mascul around masculinity. Um, Sam, you really articulated that that well earlier in terms of in itself it's not negative, but it can often then lead to toxic masculinity. In the context of the workplace. How do we, or why do we think that that uh, toxic masculinity might be hindering creating an inclusive environment for everyone that's there, whether that's employees, whether it's the managers, and whether it's the leaders of those organisations? I think there's sort of two things uh, to be said to that, um, reasons maybe why. I think the first one is sort of a bit of a meta one is sort of the outright denial that it is happening in your own workplace i think that can be probably the most toxic thing is just being completely ignorant to the fact that it can affect your workplace and i think every workplace will have or be affected by toxic masculinity in some way shape or form whether it is regardless of what gender or how many different genders are in that workplace based on how we've all been brought up um, how workplaces have been have been evolving for hundreds and hundreds of years. And I think that is an international concept. So I think number one is the denial and not actually addressing that point. If, if senior members or even lower levels in an organization are actually aware that how different actions or different systems are favoring a certain behavior, um, that might be synonymous with things like toxic masculinity. So ruthlessness is something I would relate to toxic masculinity and the idea of being considered really tough and wanting to get ahead of the team and things like that. Those ideas can hinder all, all different genders, regardless of if you are experiencing toxic masculinity yourself or if it is being exerted by one of your colleagues. So the outright denial is one. And then the other one, which I've kind of just mentioned, is 
what as an organization do you value from your from your staff do you want a team that is sh showing things like ruthlessness like leadership like always trying to do the best and outshine everyone else or do you want an organization full of staff members that are maybe exerting more what we define as feminine characteristics such as empathy and compassion and teamwork these things that we don't associate with toxic masculinity not to say that they can't be masculine traits but maybe more in a western sense we do associate those two it's about reminding people that in an organization it is good to have a balance and it it's not necessarily you need to have all of these one traits, but you need to have that mix. I hope that answered the question. Sorry, I think I might have gone off on one. <laughs> oh, I can't hear you, Joanna. Sorry. It definitely did. It definitely did answer that question there, Sam. And as you were talking, um, a further question for either of you is, um, as you were talking, some of those traits I was noting down um, uh, and, uh, and agree the, in the way that we were describing them. So ruthlessness, having to be tough, going ahead, ahead of others, comp competition. And uh, one, one thought and a question is, in some circumstances, can those traits be positive tra traits or can those traits actually be um, seen in a, in, or displayed in a, in a way that is inclusive? And is it that we have to relearn certain traits that we, that we have if we're talking about masculine traits that can create toxicity? Or is it that we need to adopt new traits? And, um, and I'm thinking that the question as, as you were speaking, so I'm responding to what you're saying there, Sam, because I absolutely agree with what you're saying, that there are a certain number of traits that we often associate to feminine, feminism, um, empathy, compassion, teamwork, but also these masculine traits that can often so create negative, toxic environments. If they were um, slightly dialed down, would that create a different environment or is it so my question really is do we have to stop those behaviors or do we have to change those behaviors slightly uh, I think I'm gonna, if i may oh. say something on mm. that part uh, one thing is uh, these traits or what we were talking of these are kind of human behaviors inherent human behaviors associated with each and every individual uh, it will be wrong to attribute it to a particular gender so this is how people have been brought up, uh, grown up. So if they're coming to the workplace, they are already at least 20 years old. So they have carrying a whole lot of background, how they have been brought up and what kind of atmosphere or the social circle they have been brought up. So they will be behaving in a certain uh, particular way. But sometimes the perception we have or some of the traits like uh, the males are associated with a caring figure or a fatherly figure uh, in terms of that but then it may not be really a positive trait because that may be creating a bias that may be limiting the opportunities to the other gender that okay you are trying to be protective but then in the way then you are trying to be protective then you are not letting the other person deal with the problems or the situations or to come up to a, their own potential so it's not that uh, we need to change any behavior, but the, what is more important is to be aware of the uh, behavior or the behavioral attributes of a person and understand each other well. It's most important thing is to understand each other's strengths and weaknesses, irrespective of the gender as an individual. If I'm working in a team, I should know that, okay, there are four or five team members or 10 team members with me what are their behavioral traits? What are their backgrounds they are coming from? I need to understand when I'm interacting with them, I'm dealing with them and getting the work done, or they are coming to me for any discussion. I need to be fully aware of those things. And I think that can be a good starting point to strike a balance and not to create any bias or to hurt anyone intentionally or unintentionally. Sam, you may would like to add something. <laughs> um, I completely agree with what you've uh, just said. I think what I was going to say is in terms of stopping or changing behaviours, um, no matter how much power you have 
in a workplace, you can't force anyone to act a certain way. I mean, you, you can have disciplinary procedures and reward certain behaviors, but you can't stop certain things. And I think it's more about allowing and reminding people that it is okay to exert other sorts of behaviors that aren't just the ones that we associate with toxic masculinity. I think it's allowing people to be a bit more enriched and treating people as holistic people. I think that's what you were just um, mentioning, Ayush, which was just reminding that people have such rich backgrounds that we need to acknowledge and that we need to remind everyone that you will have clashes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can't work together. Yeah, absolutely. As you were both saying that where we are now in terms of organizational cultures is based on many, many years of history and many, many years of reinforcing certain behaviors. So to change that overnight is, is, is difficult. And I think I absolutely agree with, with the notion of both of you in the fact that to change those behaviors, it has to be focused on, on encouraging other types of behaviors to try and create and change the narrative of what we recognize as great leadership. What are the leadership attributes that actually a leader needs to be able to succeed and therefore managers and employees need to succeed in this organization? And I think once those are started to be encouraged, then you can see a difference in terms of it not just being very strong masculine traits that we often associate with successful leadership um, I th but I think that that takes takes time and, and I also think it connects with um, something that both of you touched on earlier which is the role that our early childhood years play and the um, reinforcement of gender stereotypes that we experience before we enter the workplace and it might not be something that every workplace can change but for all of us that are parents and for all of us that are in a role where we're interacting with younger people I do think that there is a connection with responsibility from, from corporates and I'd like to touch on that as my next question what could we do at a society, at a corporate level, um, to try to change some of the quite traditional narratives that we have around both the role of boys and girls, men and women, the behaviours, and also the languages that, that, that we often use when we are talking to a young girl versus to talking to, to a young young boy. I hear so often, um, I've got uh, many young young children, I, I hear often from other parents, from, from, from schools, words that are used to describe when we're reinforcing or recognizing a positive behavior in a boy versus positive behavior in the girl. And this language is so subtle, but it has a great impact on what's a young boy and what a young girl hears. Um, so Anoush, uh, we're okay to start with you on the, this question. What, what role as parents, as corporations, as, and at society do we, do we have? And, and are, do we think we're actually able to change in, in the first instance, the um, strong gender associated roles we, we, we have? I believe uh, there's not one single factor or one particular entity, whether it's a family or the workplace or the society who can contribute. Everyone, every part of the society has to contribute if we want to bring about this change. Starting from the birth of the child where the families, if we talk about say sometime back in India, there was a strong notion or uh, that a male child was preferred over a female child. So that stereotype or that mindset needs to change within the society that whether it's a boy or a girl, both are equally important and for the society to run. And even in a family, well, why should there be a preference only for a male child? But that had been a strong feeling and in some parts of the country, still that feeling continues. But then uh, within the family, after the birth of the child from day one, as you rightly said, 
how we interact with the child what kind of words we tell them how do we motivate them how do we scold them either if they do something wrong uh, if there are say brother and sister sisters both are there in the house how we are interacting and how do we are differentiating with them if we are only bringing dolls for the uh, girls and bringing mechanical toys and cars for the boys so there is somewhere the inherent biases are getting continued there we believed and we associate like we said uh, pink is for girl blue is for boys so there then when we start saying when a child is born they are not born with those ideas of even perceiving the colors what is blue what is green what is red they don't know this is what we teach them they learn they, they learn their name they learn their gender they learn the colors they learn the society of how we teach them how do we tell them as parents or mother or father or brother or sister in the house that is what we repeatedly tell them what that is what we repeatedly show them and that is how they start their learning so learning has to start from that very phase of early childhood of how we want to develop them in the society if we tell them these things in a proper way definitely uh, that is something which is getting imprinted in their minds and that is what the notion they will develop when they uh, become adults and they go out in the society they go to the school they go to the offices similar is the situation as they step out a child steps out and goes to a school again what is they are seeing in the school or the the way the teaching is being done how they are being taught about the teachers and within teachers how the differences are being seen if they will appear in terms of the whether it's addressing sense or the discipline or the uh, behavior or the salary difference or the, the respect so they will start behaving or taking those cues in their mind and that will get slowly and slowly they will ingrain those things it's not that it is to be taught in a textbook or in a lecture class you can teach them it is what they observe they learn uh, the behavior is more learned by observing rather than being taught in a class classroom or from a textbook so that is something which needs to change and that is what we need to consciously work on and as you said it this change cannot come in an overnight it has to be brought in slowly first we have to change ourselves before we can think of changing somebody else we will have to watch our own behaviors at times unconsciously we are doing some things which may be creating an impact on the uh, child's uh, person psychology so being aware of those things unconscious bias also we need to be uh, very very careful of whether it we are at home or at workplace or in a educational institute i believe if we are aware of as an individual uh, all of us are capable of bringing that change and i absolutely in something that you just said in the the last couple of sentences there were really important um that it's thinking about our own behaviors and the things that we're saying or speaking to um a male colleague and a friend in the us on this topic and he was saying that when he really looked at the language that he had been using when he was talking to his son versus his daughters he started to write down things and um, that that that, he, that he'd said and, and and when he noticed himself saying something and he said so often he would say or make a statement um his boys were younger than his girls but he would often ask the boy to look after the girl when he would leave the, the house for for work and supposing this book the boy in in a role unintentionally um until he really started to write down some of the phrases that he was using so when he would leave home for a few days work trip he would say to his son right you're the man of the house you need to now look after your than your mother and he said and when i think about that my my son is 3 my daughter is 8 my other daughter is 14 and my wife is a grown woman why would a 3 year old boy be able to look after these three women but i always said it and it's something that i always said from you know pretty much the, the moment he was born and so as you say there to try to understand the statements that we make um with the people that we that are around us and trying to unpack why we're saying that but then thinking about the impact of what those statements have on those around us 
Sam, um, what do you have to add on that? Um, I couldn't say it better than Ayush um, said. I completely agree with what um, what was said around it. It is such a community approach. There is not one single entity that will exactly be cause and effect on a child's upbringing and their behaviour. Um, and something that you just said, actually, Joanna, um, because you were speaking about kind of the upbringing of a child, and I'm quite lucky. I'm the I'm the youngest child, um, and I have two older sisters, um, six and seven years older than me. And I was thinking, I think they were always left in charge of me when I was growing up. They're very tough. They were always, you know, making sure that I wasn't rude, and I was always scared of them. We have a great relationship now, but and I was thinking, ah, oh, maybe I was different. But then, as soon as you said that phrase, "man of the house," I remember so many times my dad saying that to me, and it. It doesn't make sense. Why? Why would I, as a young child, be the one to look after it? Uh, look after everyone. And I think it's because, even then, that's that's such a subtext of this child is going to grow up to be the person who looks after everyone else. And I think, even then, we are told. Yeah, sorry, I'm going around in circles of what I'm saying. Um, I think something else I wanted to say as well was how we need to sort of celebrate. So, in terms of the the word bias and what we what we have. We need to first let children do their one job, which is to explore and be curious about the world. That is all they need to do and all they need to worry about. They need to let themselves work out what, it, what the world is. And of course, as parents or as role models around children, we're going to have some impact on that. And we're gonna have, we're gonna need to build a scaffolding around that child in terms of make, keeping them safe and making sure that they are well enough to explore and such but what we need to also do is when they do encounter differences to their own gender or their own perception of their gender to celebrate that to ensure that there isn't a favorability on things that we do assign to different what like implicitly assign to different characteristics of masculinity and femininity but to also show that those are positives and those do make up the brilliance of other people i think just in the chat uh, someone said about how there was sort of this unwritten or unsaid favorability because of what we assign to good characteristics or maybe more favorable characteristics. And that would be a perfect example of where we need to actually remind people that difference is great and similarities are as well. No, absolutely. And um, you uh, made me feel quite emotional as you were talking there about the single role of a, a child is definitely to explore and be curious. And I think sometimes we can get lost in, 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 in so much else. And it's the beauty of children being children and, and how inquisitive that, that is. Definitely a, a separate conversation, but I think that there is something again in the in the corporate space of how do we we often lose that we often definitely lose that as we go into university and we enter enter adulthood that constant curiosity and just wanting to explore and that is a fantastic trait when we think about the traits we need to succeed in in an organisation. Um, but a really interesting point there, Sam. I want to move on to my next question and um, it links to what we've been talking about so far, so far on, on, on this panel, but it really relates to um, the sad data points that show how high male suicide is, how high male suicide is across the globe and how high it is amongst those that are between 18 and 35. And unfortunately, since um, COVID has um, started since March, April of this year, how the, 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 the suicide rates are increasing um, for, for young ma males. And I, I want to um, ask both of you why you think that that might, might be. What, what are the reasons um, at a greater society level, but then specifically, if there's anything in, in the corporate space that we that could be done to um, try to start to have a conversation about this topic. Ayush, do you want to go first or shall I? Yeah, you start. I'll, 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 I'll. 
Amazing. I think not to sound like a broken record and to keep saying the same thing again, but I do think it is such a poignant thing to say is, do we as a society or as a corporate level, level reward people for speaking about their emotions? I think maybe this is just a London thing and please feel free to disagree or write in the comments if, if this isn't a thing, but so often we say, how are you doing? And the appropriate answer is to say fine or something very short, something that does not start a conversation. We ask these questions and we don't want really a reply. We kind of just want, we say it as a politeness. So going against the grain and actually saying either something positive, like, oh, my weekend was great, I did this, but then even more going against the grain and saying, do you know what, I'm actually really struggling right now, I need some help. Is completely taboo. We don't reward people for that behavior and we're not prepared for those responses. And I think first and foremost, we need to be aware of that. I think we need to acknowledge that we aren't asking questions and wanting to hear the response. And we aren't actually, although secretly we do want to be that, per well not secretly, we do all want to be that person that helps our friends and colleagues and society. We also need to take a look at ourselves and say, am I ready to help someone? And am I ready to ask the question, how are you doing? I think in that as well, we need to, this is something I, I learned actually, I, starting this job at Survivors UK, I felt I had massive imposter syndrome over, am I prepared to actually start speaking about male rape and sexual abuse? This is such a, such a high level topic to speak about. And something I've learned is we need to remind people that you are an expert in helping other people. You don't necessarily need to be a doctor or a counsellor to help someone who is at a crisis point in their life. We have, since we are born, been taught empathy. We have, we have been taught how to care for our friends, our family, our loved ones. These are all of the tools you need to help someone in that, in that way who is in that crisis place. Um, again, as well, I think something I mentioned around what do we value in, in people um, and I've just sort of mentioned it again, is insight, I think, is one of the best things you can, you can have. It's a fantastic trait to have, to realize that I am at 110%. I need, I need help. I need to take a step back. I need to take some time to, for me. And that's not taking time for me to get back to where I was. It's taking time for me to make sure that I'm okay. And not in a productivity way, but in a, I'm important and I need to be healthy and safe way. And I think that currently that's what we, or that's what society, especially right now in COVID related times where we're all scared about our jobs, we're all scared about what the next week is gonna have. That we're all a bit scared to say, listen, I need to take a step back because we're scared that we won't be proving ourselves. But actually if from a senior level, at the more the senior end or the top end of an organization, we're saying, to people who work for us that, do you know what? Identifying vulnerability and identifying that you need help is actually one of the best things we need. We want to make sure that you are in a good place yourself so that you want to come to work so that you stay safe and you, in some instances, stay alive. Um, and I think we're not doing enough of that. We're doing a lot of focusing on the work but not focusing on the people. And I think, what we need is role models and we need the people who are in organizations that we look up to like our CEOs, like, well, whoever you might look up to, to say, to share their stories, to share that they aren't invincible people and they didn't get there by being invincible. They got there by working hard, but also making sure that they have stayed safe, that they have been resilient, that they have had help to get there. Um, yeah. <laughs> I got a bit preachy there, sorry. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Thank you. Lots of what you um, were saying really resonated with, with me. And um, I was writing down about the, the point of speaking up about your emotions and that when we ask someone if they're okay and actually just expecting them to give us an answer so we can then get on with the agenda items, getting into whatever the work. And I think that this comes connects to one of the, um, com the, the earlier questions around masculine toxicity and 
corporate cultures is that the way that corporate cultures, in, in my view, have been set up is that we often organisations think very sh short term. And it really under I understand exactly, especially in the SME market, that that happens when you're looking at what am I going to build next month? How are we going to survive? And particularly this, you know, during these times, even more so. And so we often think that working harder, putting more hours in, being more present is going to make us more productive, more efficient, get more, getting more outputs and some of these traditional ways of um, just going through and doing things always the, the same, same way and trying to do lots of new things or um, just adding more and more to our workplace rather than, and I, I say this a lot, really slowing down to speed up. And I think from a leadership perspective, that often is um, inquiring into understanding how people are around you and the connection that makes then to how you get the most from someone, how you make sure that they are working in in the most pro productive and and effective way for them and and for you as an organization and i think that that links to this connection of of, of mental well-being in, in my view mental well-being programs and programs focused around um suicide prevention and things can't be seen as additive or a separate course that people are doing these are about the conversations that people should be having every single day and as soon as you start drawing them and, and pulling them to a side as some type of separate program it often then doesn't change the just day-to-day -day conversations sorry, people are, people are having. And I think that, that that is really important and is really important as well around that showing of, of vulnerability. Anush, anything yeah. to add to that? No, primarily, uh, especially talking of the workplace, the issues involved at the workplace, it's very, very important that uh, uh, the conversation keeps on going uh, between the team members, between your subordinate and seniors. The problem occurs when that communication chain breaks, when we start acting as a uh, subordinate or a boss or a reporting officer, when we uh, let the professional relationship take over the personal touches. So that personal touch or the healing touch, when it goes missing from the workplace, that is where most of us are spending say eight to ten hours at the workplace and when we go back at home it's hardly uh, if you take out the steep time it's hardly four or six hours that we're spending at home so it's majority of the our time when we are awake we are spending at the workplace so it's a home away from home so that homely caring facility or being uh, treating your employees or the team members as part of your family unless we are able to inculcate that traits at the workplace the stress levels are always with time increasing at the workplace you are expected to deliver more you are expected to deliver at a faster pace it, your quality terms are being expected more so there's always going to remain pressure so how do we diffuse that pressure uh, and we say that again uh, relating it to the gender bias we'll say the men are supposed to do more work than a female or those thing kind of biases we create inherent whereas it may be the other way around the female team members may be able to deliver much more than a uh, male team member or a man so those are kind of things which create an undue pressure on what you are expected to deliver and that is where somewhere it leads to maybe the figures you were quoting i'm not privy to those figures or statistics when you say there are more suicides of men than uh, women uh, women but traditionally if we look at the indian society we say i can talk of the indian society that women are supposed to from the uh, childbirth they are supposed and their bodies or their mental state is prepared to take more stress, they are able to deliver more, they are able to take more hard work, they are able to manage their emotions well, they are able to express more. These are some, again, some of the stereotypes we attach to feminine gender, but possibly that is one of the reasons that uh, they are able to cope up with the pressure much better than the, uh, their counterparts.
I know it's an interesting point there as we uh, relates to resilience and does, as you're describing there, actually um, someone that has more testing times, are they, do they become more resilient? Do they become more resilient if they have a network and a support around them, whether those are peers and friends that in, enable them to become resilient? Um, du during the, 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 those times, as you were describing, for um, the experience of some, some women in, in India, and I think that what often is, is the case when you're looking at, at, at suicide globally um, and when you're looking at often why that sadly becomes um, the option for, for, for so many, it's that they haven't got um, an outlet uh, to be able to, to get the support they need. And I think if there is one commitment that organisations really need to take, it's about the investment in, in, in the support around that because as um, in our adulthood, we spend the majority of our time in, in, in the workplace. Um, and I think now more than ever, that's increasingly important given the uncertainty that so many people are, are facing. And my, my final question before we um, turn to the audience to see if there's any questions is that um, often, and it's the question we're asking for most of these panel discussions is often we talk about the responsibility of leaders, society, communities, organisations. If we take it back to the individual uh, so for us around the panel, those in the audience, anyone that's watching this after the session, what's the one thing that we could each do in relation to this, the, the topic that we're talking about? So trying to break gender biases down, trying to re reduce um, masculine toxicity in the corporate workplace. What, what, what piece of advice, what one thing could we each do Sam, I'll ask you first. I want to say like 50 things, but we don't have time. Um, for me, I think it would be, it's a good question. I think don't make it your job, make it your life. I think, and I, tr I try and say that in the least overwhelming sense possible. Um, I'm not saying that we all need to be 24 seven crusaders and campaigners, but I think that if you, it's like, we've all come here today and we've all had a really great discussion um, and so many people turned up. I think what we need after this is to talk about it with people at home, to talk about it with your friends, with your family, as well as your colleagues. We need to make sure that this is something that you really care about at the core of yourself, not just the core of your professional life. Because that's how we start to raise people and raise the future generation to make sure that they also are aware of how we need to fight inequality in the professional sense, but also in the society outside of the working life. Thanks, Sam. Oh, yeah, uh, I'll relate it in a uh, altogether different way. Uh, I'll relate it to my life history. When I was born and I was uh, there in, with my parents, we were three, we are three brothers. So my father, myself, three brothers. So my mother was the only lady in the house. And today I'm in a situation that uh, uh, my father is no more, unfortunately, but I, in my family, I have my mother, my wife and my daughter. So I am the only male person in the house. So the situation stable start. So, but how do we relate to these situations and how do we respond to these situations is something which is crucial. And uh, in bringing about the change, our, our role becomes very, very important in the society. It's not just uh, if I say myself or it's everyone's responsibility. Uh, the mothers or the daughters or uh, the brothers or the sisters together uh, as a at home, we need to bring that change. And at the workplace, uh, it's not a crusade or that um, we have to champion a cause around it. I'll say it's something which uh, 
a slow or gradual change we have to bring in our own thing as i was saying earlier we need to start reviewing and as johanna was sharing an example unless you start writing down what you are saying to your colleagues how you are communicating with your kids how you are communicating with your wife how you are communicating with your parents uh, unless you start noting down those things it becomes really difficult to understand or to see what um, is causing the problem where the problem rise so this is something which we need to first we need to start analyzing uh, how or where the root cause or the problems are uh, before we think of the solutions or look for a change to be brought in great thank you and something that both of you are saying throughout made me really think of of, of one thing that i would add to this and that's to entirely change management meetings to be meetings that cover agenda points that could be discussed by email could be discussed on teams that are really just you needing to read information confirm that you agree with that information and to instead to spend not all of those the, not all of that time but some of that time when you are face to face when we when we're able to be or when we are making a commitment to or be on a teams call or be on 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 a zoom call so be actually investing in that time to go to deeper into the question you asked them of how are you doing and to understand that because I think if you change the narrative of how you work as the most senior leadership team in the organization and being genuinely inquisitive and of wanting to understand how people are doing actually a lot of the stuff that is often covered in leadership meeting agendas is you're able to confirm those via email so spend the time when you're actually together or when you're actually talking to do the things that you need to do at a human connection level and i think that again would reinforce a different um, set of behaviors that you're encouraging in, in in your workplace and start small with that don't entirely change every every meeting because also that that in my view wouldn't wouldn't work I want to see if um, anyone in the in the panel, and um, perhaps I'll hand back to to you for a moment. If you, perhaps you or anyone in the panel, has any uh, questions. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Sam and Ayush. Uh, I will now ask some of the audience questions, you guys. The first one uh, is, and guys, please feel free to uh, ask any questions. Anyone in the audience. Um, Living in the 21st century, we witness a massive shift and change when it comes to schools, universities, and education in general. I believe it's important to take gender concerns into account when the educational programs are being designed. Do you agree with that? And to what extent this should be addressed? And what do you think should be the main point um, solution when it comes to education and gender bias? So I guess more to do with how education relates to uh, gender roles and how we can change that. Um, I, I do agree. I think that in terms of intersectionality of all students who are going through university, I think there's a lot happening right now. I was really lucky to go to Bournemouth University and I graduated two years ago. And just as I was sort of leaving, there were lots of different campaigns about how the education system can favor people from certain different things, whether that's gender, whether that's race, age, loads of different things. And I think we need to be aware of this and we need to make sure that we are being as, as unbiased as possible. Um, so things like anonymous marking to make sure that you, the marker doesn't know who this student is or what gender they are, what race, what age, all of the different things that make up a person. Um, sorry, I'm just re reading the question again. Um, what would you think should be the main points? So, I think also in terms of the curriculum that we're shown, um, in terms of the things that we're learning and the people that we are learning from. So, philosophers from different genders who are different ages from different cultures. I think we need to have more of that. I think it shouldn't just be completely white androcentric philosophers that we learn about. We need to have a more holistic and rich view in our education. But thank you for the question, uh, Victor. 
and as i said earlier uh, the education system has a very important role to play and i fully agree uh, that we need to make the systems more robust and relook at the way the education is designed or the courses are designed uh, going back to the example of an early childhood it impacts the first uh, grade or the second grade when we start going to the school and when we step out from our homes as the child is going to a external world school possibly is the first interface formal interface uh, an individual is facing so how we are taught what courses or the way of not just the courses the way things are taught and the way we are being evaluated as sam just said uh, it makes a whole whole lot of difference so definitely uh, there's no question that the things needs to be in the current situation we find ourselves in there is a need to relook into those things and bring about a positive change in the education system so that we develop as better human beings uh, irrespective of the gender we we are definitely and this question kind of reminded me of something from my school time where in math textbooks we used to, whenever there were problems uh, it always used to have like he like he did this he walked so many miles and you have to calculate this and that but then you know after a few years um i don't know if you guys can you guys hear me there's some I think problem in your line breaking a bit patchy that's fine <laughs> um i don't know if it's any better now but i can probably just move on to the next question um <laughs> the next question is from saloni how can we inspire more people around us to break down gender stereotypes what role can uh, women play here see uh let me take this first uh when we say how do we inspire how can we inspire more people is primarily first thing is that we need to uh be the role models be show in our own behavior how we are dealing with our colleagues how we are dealing with our team members uh we need to set an example not in a pressure that okay we have to set an example that is why i'll use a particular word or a sentence or uh, try to fake my behavior or fake my words or fake my sentences when i am calling my colleagues or having a meeting we we need to inculcate those things in our behavior and that is something we learned as i said we learned so much from each other rather than from a textbook so that is the first thing uh, we have to see and we need to more than anything else again maybe i am repeating my thing we need to respect others behavior we need to understand uh, if there are different genders within the society or different age groups or different uh, people from diverse backgrounds how do i respect each one's behavior and each one's way of working is something which is important and this is possibly the best way to inspire others uh, than doing anything else and and specifically if you talk of what role women can play i think it's the same role it's then that need not be any different than what a male member has to do it's it has to be the exactly the same for each and every one of us there's no separate thing which a man or a woman needs to do to bring about a change we all need to do the same thing I completely agree. I think it's all about uh role models and exhibiting the behavior that you would want or in an organization making sure that people who are coming in are aware of how different colleagues treat each other and that's the community that you want to reward and that you want to celebrate. I also think that oh, I've lost my train of thought, but um in terms of how how we make sure that we can break down those sorts of biases is also to celebrate each other's differences i think as i just mentioned and yeah sorry i for i blather on um <laughs> no uh thank you ayush sam uh just two more questions uh one is do you and do you and the sarge leaders showing vulnerability will improve as people from younger generations become leaders I 
I, I hope so, and I think so. Um, I think that there is a lot more publicity and a lot more awareness around mental health now um, for people who are going to become future leaders and CEOs, et cetera, et cetera, and senior ranking people. Um, and I hope that that is something that doesn't get quelled when going into the workplace. Um, and I also think, as was mentioned throughout this, um, this panel, that it may have started off small, but the traction that these sorts of movements are getting is getting bigger and bigger. Um, and I hope that, yeah, one day that vulnerability is actually seen as something that is a, a positive quality of someone and that actually seeking help for vulnerability is also something. Yeah, I would like to add, Mala, it's not just uh, uh, when the younger people take the leadership position, but as the diversity at the workplace increases, be it the young people, be it the people from different social backgrounds, be it the people from different genders, when we have a diverse leadership board, possibly uh, the things will change for better and the vulnerability of the leadership team will definitely get balanced out uh, in my view. So it's the diversity, like we say, diversity in the boardroom. How do we bring about the diversity in the leadership is going to be the key. And that young, it's not just the young balance between the young and the experienced or the old or the balance between the males and the females, balance between the people from different social strata, that is going to bring about change and reduce the vulnerability uh, at the workplace. That, that, that's the key to the thing. Great. Uh, I'm conscious of the time, so I'll have to end the audience questions for now. Uh, but thank you so much for everyone who's joined, and thank you so much, Sam and Ayush, uh, for agreeing to speak uh, today. Uh, I think it was a fantastic session and I'm sure the audience has learned a lot. Uh, 